Why did the woman in black, a woman of unquestioned virtue, of intelligence and integrity, marry a lone shark who wore white socks? <laughs> and secondly, do we have some special obligation in this moment to turn back to, to re-embrace, or perhaps to embrace, the mission she set for us when she said that we should improve social and living conditions in the United States. Let me address the second question first. I take as my text a statement by President George W. Bush. President George W. Bush, in January, said, income inequality is real. I offer two facts which I would like to stipulate to create the context for taking George W. Bush's important statement as my text. The Democrats in 2006 campaigned arguing that they would do something about income inequality, fact one, and fact two, in January they held hearings on the topic. My text, George W. Bush, in the context of Democrats having presupposed for more than two decades that income inequality was real, finding their realization ratified by George W. Bush. This is, in my judgment, a magic moment. <laughs> it is a magic moment because the person who frames the language controls the debate, and this language was framed by scholars, some of them in this room, some of them founded, funded, by the Russell Sage Foundation. When you call it death tax, you eliminate it. You call it a state tax, you keep it. When you call them personal savings accounts, you want them. When you call it privatized Social Security, you don't. When, in the context of the last two days, you call it intact dilation and extraction, you protect it. But when you call it partial birth abortion, you say, bad thing, we'll ban it. And when you call it income inequality, you try to get rid of it. You call it income inequality in part because scholars at Russell Sage gave it that name. And whether they said they were neutral or value free or not, I don't care. They gave it a name that impels action. And that vocabulary is now shaping a debate that is being held on their terms, not my terms, but their terms. And that means they have a privileged position in the debate, and they've earned it. And Russell Sage deserves some credit in the background for having the good judgment to frame questions that invited them to submit the proposals that were funded. Frank Levy, Dollars and Dreams, 87. Sheldon Danziger, Peter Gottschalk, America Unequal, 1995. They established evidence. They didn't just grab a vocabulary. Whether they get credited with originating it, I don't know. But they get a lot of credit in my book for popularizing it if they didn't. But they established an evidentiary base to back the language to drive a debate that is now potentially moving into a moment that could yield change. They established it exists. They established it's increasing. And their assumption was that that wasn't a good thing. Russell Sage board members, scholars, are now finding the telling pieces of information to take into that debate so that the public can understand why it ought to support a movement to try to get rid of the problem called income inequality. Well, get rid of is too strong, but try to address it in some meaningful way. And we're beginning, by the way, to see another phrase come into the vocabulary that pushes the debate in one direction. And Russell Sage has used those words a lot, too, and that's low-wage work. And carried with that language is the assumption that there are people who can work what we would call a longer-than-average work week and work really hard and work really well, and they can't feed their families. And that's a problem. And when you describe it that way and you call it low-wage work, you impel a discussion about solutions. So potentially riding in on income inequality is low-wage work, and now we're starting to be able to put together sentences. 
And then we've got people like Alan Blinder. And Alan can find evidence that is telling better than any economist I know. This is in part because the economists I read make no sense to me whatsoever, and Alan makes marginal sense on most days. <laughs> Listen to this telling fact in the context now of this language. In 1979, the average taxpayer in the top one-tenth of one percent earned about as much as 44 average taxpayers. The bottom half, in the bottom half, in 2001, the rich taxpayer earned as much as nearly 160 less affluent people. That's a nice digest in the form of defensible fact that is not questioned on either side. And what's important about it is, Alan didn't say it in a scholarly book talking to other scholars. He said it on television and in newspapers and in other venues that, well, maybe the whole public doesn't read, but elite non-economists do read, and now the telling fact is starting to be marshaled outside the scholarly community in service of language that potentially impels action. Now, there is some help in other quarters for which Russell Sage gets no credit that I know of. The best soundbite wasn't Allen's. It was Barney Frank's. Congressman Frank said, a rising tide lifts all boats, and that's true as long as you have a boat. <laughs> Is that worth repeating? It's worth repeating in the context in which it is placed historically because, of course, you recognize John Kennedy's statement. You recognize the fact that conservatives arguing against some of those positions taken by people who use the word income inequality have used it as well in service of their own argument for tax cuts, only now it is turned in service of the income inequality debate, and now the rhetoric is three for three on one side of the argument. Once the president assumes that it's real, he could argue, but it's good. At which point, you'd have a contest. But suppose instead, just hypothetically, that he assumed it was a problem. Let's assume he wanted to get No Child Left Behind reauthorized, and let's assume that he thought that education would be a viable solution to this problem, and so he grants it as a problem for whatever reason, perhaps a moment of insight, but nonetheless grants that it is a problem. At the point at which he grants that it is a problem, it is much more difficult for other people of like ideology to come in and say, no, it's not. I'm reading from the Wall Street Journal. Top White House economic officials still don't consider today's inequality, the growing share of income going to those at the top, an inherently bad thing. They believe it simply reflects the rising rewards accruing to society's most skilled and productive members. Now notice, their top White House economic officials, they presumably work for President George Bush, and he assumes it's a problem, so they're just irrelevant. There are other people who have entered the debate, but now in a context in which the President of the United States assumes it's a problem, that is, we need to do something to solve it, education not a bad solution. Alan Blinder even said to news organizations, Education should be out there on the table in relationship to the problem. So I'm still in this debate thinking, this is a really good debate. It's going in the right directions. An economist, Russell Roberts, who's a professor of economics at George Mason University and a research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, says this. I'm now in public debate, so I'm looking to see who talks in places that Alan Blinder talks. He says, the measured level of inequality is, in fact, the result of the choices that millions of us make individually. Decisions to go to school or drop out, decisions to marry or divorce, decisions to emigrate to America or stay in one's home country. Let me repeat that so that you hear the operative word in the sentence. The measured level of inequality is, in fact, the result of the choices that millions of us make. Now, I hear that as a non-economist to say that people are choosing poverty, which seems to me to be an odd interpretation. 
Nonetheless, there are other things in that sentence that might well be engaged in a scholarly discussion that frames causes and options to address the issue. This is an important moment. It's time to frame the answer to the question, what are the causes? What are the possible remedies? Is it remediable? What can we do? And when should we do it? And how should we do it? And what are the costs? And is it desirable? But we're potentially now well down the stream of the debate. And the debate is being engaged on terms set in part by Russell Sage scholars. I asked two questions. The second question, which I said I would answer first, was does, is this a moment in which we should go back and look at, perhaps re-embrace, perhaps embrace, our founding mission statement from Mrs. Sage, which says, we're supposed to improve social and living conditions in the United States. We are positioned as a Russell Sage Foundation, I think, to watch some of our finest scholars enter a socially consequential debate framed on terms hospitable to notions that will lend themselves to solutions that might make concepts like low-wage work translate into a better life for some of those people that many of you have studied. We are at a moment in which the debate potentially brings scholarship from across the whole portfolio of Russell Sage. Because as I read the public discussion, I hear words such as immigration. I hear words such as education as a solution. I hear words that talk as if they are speaking to the research tradition this foundation has set in place over the last 30 years. This is a magical moment for the foundation to marshal that research from across this collective community. And if the debate is handled well, and if our leaders are responsible, and if God is willing, and if the forces collide in the appropriate way, we might help improve social and living conditions in the United States. Let me return to my first question. Why did this woman in black, a woman of obvious virtue, a woman whose instincts included a strong desire to increase the likelihood that women had education, marry a loan shark who wore cheap suits and white socks? It couldn't have been an easy decision. Here is my answer. <laughs> the woman who would become Mrs. Russell Sage had been a low-wage worker. Eric told you that. Did he not? She knew what in income inequality was like, even if the language had not yet been framed to have that concept at hand. She calculated, perhaps out of love, perhaps out of Christian altruism, that if she were to marry Russell Sage, she could begin first to raise her economic status. That would produce less income inequality. She could start bleeding down his fortune in service of empowering individuals, particularly women, with education, thereby reducing income inequality. And at his death, she could dedicate his fortune not only to socially just causes, because she did things other than found Russell Sage, and they helped the poor. Unfortunately for this general narrative, the deserving poor, but nonetheless, we will set that aside, her concept of deserving poor. But at the same time, she created this foundation. She created it to improve social and living conditions in the United States. She created it so that at this point in time, you, the scholars who've created this vocabulary and this evidence and this framing and this moment would make it less likely that any virtuous person would ever have to marry a loan shark, male or female. <laughs> who wore white socks and cheap suits. 